Hello, I'm Krzysztof Szkrowski. I'm a PhD student at the Technological University Dublin, and I'm trying to develop an objective measure of presence in mediated environments. My supervisor is Dr. Matt Smith. I've been developing VR software for a few years now, and today I'm sharing some of the lessons that I have learned while experimenting with VR. Before deploying your experiments, test it on users without experience using VR. To avoid surprises. For example, I discovered that participants can press the HTC Vive menu button by accident when mounting on the VR headset. During an unstructured debriefing of my pilot's participant, I asked how long he thought he was in the virtual replica of the physical environment, and I was very impressed with the accuracy of his answer. When I complimented it, he said it wasn't difficult to keep track of time with the clock. My reply was, what clock? Beware, the power button can overlay the menu over the content that you plan to display to your participants, and you might not see it on the back end if it happens on the HMD hardware side. I recommend disabling any buttons that are not essential for your experiment. To some of my participants, mounting the VR headset was more challenging than anticipated. Some of them managed to complete it in a few seconds, others needed more than a minute. If you will be using time series analysis, keep it in mind that lengths of the time series for such tasks might differ widely between participants. And if we are on the subject of time, beware that timestamps can be formatted in different ways, which can be a surprise when you are merging data on timestamp from different hardware. In my case, it took me a while to figure out why I could not align data from biometric sensors with the data from the computer used to run the experiment during the analysis. In general, I really recommend reading the documentation. It takes time, but it can save your experiment from discovering errors after you collect your data and find the problems during its analysis. For example, Instead of instantiating a new color grading object in post-processing stack every time I was changing saturation of an image display to the participant, I should have overwrite the existing one. It can take some time to generate a pile of garbage that will have an impact on performance. So before deploying your experiment, make sure you test your software for the maximum length of time your experiment might take in the worst possible scenario. And remember that RTFM rule really does apply in software engineering. Okay, let's move on to tips and tricks. Users' well-being is very important for the VR industry, and rightfully so. But to the point that heavy restrictions are being implemented into engines to protect them from mad and or incompetent developers. However, to carry out your experiments, sometimes you need to find some ways to go around such restrictions. For example, the field of view and control over refresh rate had to be modulated to investigate participants' physiological responses to such processes in my experiments. However, control over these parameters was disabled on the version of the Unity game engine that was used to develop software for these experiments. In case of participant field of view, I just overweigh the rectangular over the camera to obstruct participant's field of view when I need it. And by controlling its size, I managed to easily go around this obstacle. The refresh rate was a bit more complicated, but I threw away for seconds objects onto the main thread and the waiting time was adjusted based on the rendering time of the last frame. Worked like a charm. Although, Bear in mind that disabling vSync can create additional screen tearing problems. Computation of mathematics can be expensive with complex geometry. In one of my experiments, I was using a cloud component which needed more subdivision to render more realistic movement of the walls of the marquee that was used in the experiment. In the high fidelity version, the model had almost 65,000 of polygons and 40,000 vertices, which is not a lot but it was designed to make it easy to render. 
but the low fidelity version had below 2000 polygons and a bit over 1300 vertices. With the normal maps being used, the murky walls and roof were practically indistinguishable when they were remaining static. Parameters that are important to monitor might be displayed through the UI available to the experimenter, which is something I would recommend. Dynamic lights and shadows are computationally expensive, but are not necessary for static objects. This can be baked in advance. To increase replicability of your study, I recommend developing the software needed to conduct it with support to a broad range of VR headsets and other hardware like sensors, etc. that might be available at different labs. <laughs> and for the same reason, I advise to try to provide as much backward compatibility as possible. Obviously, it's not feasible to support the sort of demo class or all VR headsets ever made but it can be a holy grail on the list of objectives during the software development for your experiment, which should increase the capacity of replicability of your experiments. Publishing your code written for running the experiment as an open source should also help with reproducibility and for the development of your research. I also highly recommend following the open science framework and obtaining permissions from your participants to publish anonymized data to give other researchers an option to analyze it in the way they see most feasible, or to facilitate meta-analysis. Thank you. I'll try my best to answer your questions now.